Joanna H. That's okay. Great. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today at this bright blue oral evidence session for our conservatism and human rights project. Um, just to say that the project is a year-long inquiry, which is led by six commissioners. Uh, they are um, Caroline Spellman MP, Dominic Greve QC MP, Maria Miller MP, Lord Finkelstein, Matthew Jancona, and Benedict Rogers. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, there is a vote in Parliament, so the MPs um, who are going to be here, in particular Maria and Dominic, unfortunately cannot join this session. But it is being filmed. Your comments will be tweeted about, um, and they will be you, they will be transcribed and put in the final report as an annex. Um, but it will be made clear that obviously you don't necessarily, you or your organisations don't necessarily endorse. Um, uh, what our report says, the, the final recommendations, and that you're here in an independent capacity. So that, that will be made very clear. Just to introduce us, so uh, we are the Bright Blue research team. So I'm the director of Bright Blue. Uh, Nigel is our head of research and James is our research on the project. So we will be the people compiling the report, which the commissioners will ultimately sign off on. So this last session of the day for us is on modern slavery, which um, the Prime Minister has described um, as the uh, greatest human rights issue of our day. So um, what I want to do is ask each of you just to introduce yourselves um, and your organisation and then perhaps give us your introductory remarks on the issue before we then begin to probe you. So um, Major Anne, if we can go with you first. Right. So. Um Please call me Anne. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> and, you and you don't have to tweet that. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I'm Director of Anti-Trafficking and Modern Slavery for the Salvation Army. So you may know this, but we've had the government contract now for five and a half years to manage the support for all adult victims of human trafficking and modern slavery in England and Wales. So we've seen a, a huge increase in the number of victims from our first year when we had 373. Uh, victims uh, referred into the service and this last year where we had over 1,400 victims uh, referred into the service uh, overall around 6,000 victims over the last five and a half years have uh, come into our, our support service. We work with 11 subcontractors and uh, we work very much in a partnership model and Kate and Unseen uh, are very much part of our, our uh, support service program. Um, so I've been in this role for about seven and a half years. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to this. Um, I'd be very happy for you to, to drill down into some of the data that the Salvation Army has uh, as a result of our, our uh, role. Um, but I would just say one or two very broad things um, to start off with, and that is to say really why this commission and why the fact that you're looking at this issue is so important and please forgive me if I'm stating the obvious but I think it's worth yeah. stating. So when we say that every human being is of value, every human being is of value, then and everyone is deserving of dignity and respect, then we're all enriched and that's why it's really important that we, we get this right as individuals and as communities and um, our communities are stronger and healthier when every individual is given the dignity and value that they uh, deserve. Conversely, when we consider an individual as having lesser rights or being, enough, being of less value or less deserving or of less dignity, then we were all um, disempowered and impoverished. So. Uh, fi even financially we save nothing if we are uh, if we view people in that way so the Modern Slavery Act uh, whilst welcoming all that the government has done to um, make strides in this area doesn't approach the matter of victims from a human rights perspective it's a top down approach um, and it's a top down solution um, it relies on state action rather than intrinsic value of a victim as a human being with intrinsic rights. 
and uh, the victims of modern slavery are not just a problem to be solved. Uh, this requires a, a paradigm shift. And so we ensure that our, our response to a victim is truly victim-centred. Thank you. Okay. So my background, uh, briefly, I wrote two reports for Andrew Broff when I worked at City Hall. I now work at the Human Trafficking Foundation. Um, unlike uh, Salvation Army and Unseen, we don't deal directly with victims. We act more as a kind of conduit between the NGOs and the parliamentary and statutory sectors. Um, and we have a forum which happens quarterly where we have about 500 stakeholders. So we, we try and sort of work together and encourage, sort of, we try and prevent silo work, which, which happens a lot in NGO sectors traditionally. Um, in terms of, uh, I know I've only got three minutes, so I was going to just briefly say that our last forum, um, a lawyer actually came to speak about Brexit and their concerns. Um, and he specifically talked about the fact that victims of trafficking are actually unprotected in British law and they tend to always use European law um, as, as standard. Um, but having spoken to legal experts, they say aside from Brexit, they've got even bigger concerns around if the Human Rights Act was scrapped because Article 4 is something they use daily um, and it would be a great day for traffickers if we scrapped that. Um, obviously, as, as Anne so beautifully put, the, the Modern Slavery Act it's a great first step, it really is, um, but it doesn't focus on the human rights of victims, it focuses on the prosecution of traffickers. And it's a catch-22 because we're seeing very few convictions and there's a reason for that. And it's because we aren't focusing enough on the human rights aspect of victims. They're not providing the right level of evidence, they're not, they're not wanting to work with police, etc. So I'm going to very briefly, in two and a half minutes, go through my six main points, which I'd really be happy to elaborate on <laughs> later. Um, and these are the reasons why we think we aren't supporting their human rights and why they aren't, we aren't getting convictions. So one, there is statutory support and provided to victims of trafficking, which are both unseen is, is led and coordinated by the Salvation Army. That's great. A lot of the safe houses are really brilliant. But the problem is there's no sort of minimum standard. Um, we, we created a care standard um, book, but there's no minimum standard around what's provided. So we're hearing about 40% of victims are going into asylum accommodation. I don't know if you know much about asylum accommodation, but it's pretty horrendous. Um, we're hearing about entire families being put in one room, not having any access to cooking facilities for a month, maybe up to a year with young children. Um, no childcare, so they're going into interviews with police, talking about horrendous experiences with the child in the room. Um, that, that's, just, that's just a brief, brief summary. So that's number one. Number two is the lack of long-term support. So great, the Home Office provides this short-term support for victims while we try and understand whether they're trafficked or not. But the system is very odd in that we spend millions on this support, and as soon as a person is recognised as trafficked, we say, great, you're recognised as trafficked, you now have two weeks to exit the safe house and there's nothing there. The, the Home Office assumes the local authorities will pick it up. The DCLG doesn't seem to be aware of this. There hasn't been any extra funding. So what we're finding is victims are being re-trafficked or going back to sort of friends who are not necessarily people who are guiding them back into the right places. Or we're finding a lot of victims even on the streets. Um, three, which links to the last point, all of this is in the Home Office. It's great that Theresa May took this issue so seriously and has prioritised it, but it shouldn't just be in the Home Office. This should be in all departments, prioritised in all departments. Um, that is why the DCLG doesn't really have the support. If you talk to the Home Office, they assume victims will be supported when they leave the safe house by local authorities. They aren't. There's a number of other really interesting cases of how the departments are working together, which I'd be happy to elaborate on. The fourth issue is the criminalisation of victims. That's in a multiple way. So it's obviously um, people who are trafficked to are sex workers who are working in brothels, but also people who are working in cannabis farms. We're also hearing about British victims, for example, children as young as eight who are being used for drug trafficking, essentially, in gangs. So some adults getting a lot of money, giving a little bit of money to a child to, to maybe carry drugs internally across the country, we're still treating them as criminals. And then there's a broader issue of immigration. Obviously, a lot of victims aren't coming forward because there's lots of immigration offences. The Home Office is stuck between a rock and a hard place because they have to deal with immigration. I totally understand that. But modern, modern day slavery, isn't about immigration. In fact, focusing on immigration means that victims are hiding. So there's a real clash and conflict of interest. The fifth point is child victims of trafficking. We don't have any specialist care for victims, child victims at the moment. Um, and that's a serious gap. A report has just come out today that said a third of trafficked children in care are going missing. That's horrendous. Um, and the last point, the sixth point, I think I've just made in three minutes, hopefully, is compensation and legal aid. Um, between 2003 and 2014, Three cases, only three cases, I think, that where the principal offence was human trafficking resulted in a trafficker being made to pay compensation. Now, the Mon Slavery Act said this is not good enough, we really need to prioritise compensation, but the legal aid agency didn't get that message, and they're not, and victims aren't getting 
legal aid. And we're actually hearing, uh, lawyers are telling us, they're finding it easier to get traffickers legal aid than victims. There's a whole other series of obstacles for why victims aren't getting compensation. Again, I'd be happy to go into them. Um, and so that's my sixth and final issue around human rights. Very interesting, <laughs> very concise. Thank you, Tamara. Um, Kate. Hello, um, I'm Managing Director of the Anti-Slavery Organisation in um, Unseen. Um, we've, I've spent the last eight years uh, working directly with survivors, law enforcement agencies and governments and other partners to work out how we can tackle this issue. And hopefully, I think, what my two colleagues here have just said, I'm probably going to just kind of reiterate, which might be reassuring, but also might be slightly tedious for you after a very long day, so apologies in advance. Um, so I think um, we feel that we were beginning to see a teasing apart between the links between slavery and immigration issues, but again, recently think that the anti-immigration rhetoric um, has risen and I think the enactment of the Immigration Act coupled with new policy from uh, agencies like DWP in terms of entitlement and rights to work has kind of in our opinion been catalysts to rejoining these issues together which as we've already heard can be really problematic directly for victims. Um, has a de detrimental effect on both victims of the crime of slavery as well as policy direction and I think that concerns us because it has the potential to make the UK a really hostile environment for victims um, which is problematic and I think as has been reiterated already this said the political will and support that we're currently seeing for the issue of modern slavery is incredibly welcomed the implementation of the Modern Slavery Act the Prime Minister's Task Force the recent announcement of funding are all incredibly kind of important milestones and land um, landmarks to take this agenda forward I think we are, however, cognizant of the fact that we actually need to see change on the ground to ensure that victims are identified and regardless of nationality or immigration status are not denied their human rights. And we need to ensure, I think, if I'm allowed to say this, the opportunity and um, how do we harness the goodwill that currently is in government and make sure that is transferred to tangible, cost-effective change on the ground that directly impacts those that we work with. So I think change that positively impacts victims is kind of um, what we would like to see. Um, I think uh, thinking about the Human Rights Bill and the British Bill of Rights and any recommendations that might be focusing on human rights, we need to make sure they're compatible with the European Directive and strengthen human rights. And that means they need to offer a consistent approach with the Modern Slavery Act. It means they need to include policy, legislation and statutory provisions for victims. And it also needs to um, join the different government departments together and have them involved in any kind of bill or recommendations development. Um, I think as Tamara mentioned, we see the issue sitting in isolation and departments are kind of further ahead than others. I think we'd advocate for any bill or recommendations to ensure that you join the dots uh, across government departments, policy and legislation and that's really important and I think we also need to focus on enshrining the rights of victims in legislation. I think as Anne mentioned earlier the rights of victims are relatively underdeveloped in UK law and we rely heavily on European law. If in the future, depending on what European law looks like um, and whether we have it to rely on or not, depending the direction Brexit takes, that means victims would have to fall back on the Modern Slavery Act. And this currently, um, again, as Anne said, is a top-down solution. It relies on state intervention and administrative processes, not focusing on providing individual rights. Um, I think there to date has been failures of government and parliament to consider the effects of law and policy change on victims and I think this coupled with um, a lack of victim-centred law means that slavery in the UK and their victims are disproportionately reliant on the European law and I think that needs to be considered when we are um, looking at recreating any, any bill that we might be. Um, I think we also need to uh, consider putting the national referral mechanism on a statutory footing, um, enshrining the rights and protections afforded to victims in legislation, and then again beginning to join those dots. I think, as Tamara has mentioned, the issue of long-term accommodation and support needs to be addressed. Um, if we are truly going to allow individuals to contribute to society, we need to ensure that they get the support that they need from the beginning right through to the end. We need to standardise access and entitlements for those who have been identified as victims. Um, I think understanding the interaction again that different government departments make and the impact that that has on a victim on the ground um, is really important. And I think referring to previous comments around Brexit, we need to specifically make sure the integration and expansion of any existing policy and legislation fundamentally focuses on victims' rights and that if we lose any current EU legislation, that doesn't mean that people are held in a position of exploitation for longer than necessary because of fear around immigration status. 
So I think it is um, encouraging that you're thinking about modern slavery in terms of human rights review, um, and I think it has to be addressed, but I think the plea from Unseen is that it's addressed um, across department, legislatively and policy-wise, and making sure that kind of what the victim needs is at the centre of that. Okay, very interesting. Thank you to all of you. I'm going to ask a question first on um, this, both Tamara and uh, Kate mentioned this, which is the reliance on EU law. Um, uh, I just want to understand more the relationship there between the Modern Slavery Act and the EU law you're mentioning, and then you, I think it was Article 3 or something somebody mentioned. Can you just just clarify a bit what you're particularly asking for, which is in a Brexit situation, there is a particular directive that you are fearful will not be brought into UK law? Yes, do you want to? Um, yes, um, sorry, to ask, ask the last, ask, just as you were saying your final word, I was looked down, what was the last sentence you said? The last sentence was, you're fearful that a certain directive or schedule in EU law will not be brought in to UK law. Oh, the, well, the Article 4 in the Human Rights Act, right, um, okay, which is focus sorry. on non-slavery. Um, that's used for so many different things, um, and so it's just critical that that remains. Um, so that's, yeah, and that, that, that's in the Human Rights Act. And that's think. derived, presumably, from the European Convention? Yes. yes. Right, right okay. I think the I'm, government's not asking to withdraw from no, that? No, I think um, the concern for us would be the European Convention against trafficking in human beings, so the Palermo Protocol. So the UK, com the EU Convention sets out rights and standards and a directive for all member states to follow in terms of dealing with victims. Um, the Modern Slavery Act hasn't necessarily yet enshrined how it wants to deal with victims. It has put a clause in that says um, we can enact, if we want to, the NRM onto a strategy footing. The NRM is the mechanism by which we support and look after victims that comes directly from the EU directive. I see. Therefore, if we remove ourselves from the EU directive, we potentially lose the impetus to care for victims at that level because we don't have that enshrined in the Modern Slavery Act yet. Right, okay, so you're looking for that directive or the substance of that directive? To yeah, the support, the support UK. element. All victim yeah. support currently is, um, the, stat the only statutory footing for, the, for it is in policy and they, that has yet to be created. And it's, I think it's worth mentioning that I think the, the England and Wales Modern Slavery Act has less than the Northern yes, Ireland and the Scottish Scotland. Acts, which do actually have a bit more victim focus. Yes, they very much do. So it's yeah, worth sort of having a little bit yeah. And then there, were, there was an interesting issue raised by Tamara around uh, the criminalisation of victims, for example, to do with sex workers, drugs, etc. Um, one thing that we were looking at as well is around people who were forced to do criminal acts um, and then not being protected under the if they're slaves and being they're being forced to do criminal acts as slaves not being wholly protected uh, under the modern slavery act so it's it sounds like there are still um you know I, I can see that you're all concerned that there isn't enough to do with supporting victims but it still seems that there's some legal leap loopholes or enhancements in the law which are needed um to protect people uh can, can you just talk me through that, what you want to see in terms of more legal protection other than this EU directive? Um, well, I mean, the, the, I, I feel like lawyers would be the best place to talk about the different legal aspects, but certainly what we know is happening. I mean, even, we've, we've got a lot better in terms of, for example, cannabis farms. It's a known case example now around human trafficking. Yeah. And yet, in the last year, I've heard about the fact that police found, for example, a person who had been trafficked into a cannabis farm and then they went missing because of the lack of support around victims. Um, and they got found somewhere, I think, up north, um, and the police tried to contact the police and say, look, please leave this person alone. They're, they're gonna, they were going to be actually a, a witness in our case. And yet the, per the, the person was still convicted. So that's where even within police, that's when they're being advised by police not to do anything and other police are acting. So that, that's how, no, how challenging it is. Um, but in terms of... Uh, but I think with the, the sort of county lines thing, again... I spoke recently at an event with a lot of local authorities and I mentioned the fact that boys, for example, in gangs who are, you know, as I said, some as young as eight, but, you know, often they're maybe 12, 13, 14, being used to carry drugs across the country. Um, and I said that this is a problem and that we actually, these boys are being exploited. Um, they can't consent. And that issue of consent, it isn't, I think that there have been criticisms of the Slay Act around that issue of consent, especially with children. The fact that it isn't, it could be made more explicit 
um, and is made more explicit in other laws. Um, and I think that's yeah, that's that's a real concern. And I think uh, the lo- the local authorities responded by saying, well, we've got this problem with drugs, and that's one of our priorities, so we need to be dealing with this. So there's, for the police and local authorities, there's these conflicting priorities, and that's that's part of the challenge again with immigration offences. If if people are going in looking for immigration issues, with say um, going into a brothel and they've got a bunch of immigration officers with them, yeah. how it, why is a victim going to say if they know that they're there illegally? Uh, you know, going to work with the police because they also know that they're doing something illegal. Um, and we've heard of cases where um, a trafficker has actually, the, 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 the victims become ill, so they're not of any use, and the trafficker has actually contacted the Home Office to report the person to, to get rid of them, uh, which shows the confidence of traffickers because we, we struggle so much to convict them and the vulnerability of, of victims. That's very interesting. I think the, um, from my understanding, there is provision for that within the Modern Slavery Act. Um, and CPS, I know, worked very hard prior to the Modern Slavery Act coming in, especially around the criminalisation of cannabis cultivation and ensuring that the f- question was asked first, are you potentially a victim of trafficking? So I feel like the legal framework is there. Okay. I think the issue for me is, is it used? And are police officers, frontline professionals and CPS aware of all of the areas where people may be forced into criminality. And I think what we're dealing with is a complex hidden crime that changes what it looks like on a very regular basis. Therefore, cannabis cultivation, as you said, we are very good at asking people when we find them in cannabis um, cultivation places, um, these are the things we're looking for, are you doing this of your own free will? Like The police have pretty much got that down, and yet new areas that we may be slightly unsighted on, we're not necessarily as good to do that just yet. So I think there's an element of the complexity of the crime Crime, plus the fact the kind of raising awareness with frontline professionals so that they understand the kind of spectrum of exploitation, the spectrum of consent, and actually the fact that the Modern Slavery Act has now increased the definition of slavery to include elements where you don't have to have been moved and you don't have to have been kind of controlled in the same way as you would have had to historically with human trafficking. So I think there's a bit of a learning curve as well around the legislation that's now in place. And who's driving that and who should be driving that? That's a good question. Um, So I know that National Policing are doing a lot of work um, with uh, Mr Sawyer. So he is the National Policing Lead for Modern Slavery. Um, So I know they're they're doing a lot of work around training and working with the College of Policing in order to get kind of training packages together for frontline police officers. I think um, in any big agency you're going to have issues with a custody sergeant needing to know far different information potentially to a chief investigating officer who has reams of intelligence. Um, I know the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner has worked with Health and the NHS to create kind of DVDs and packages around awareness raising. So I think it's almost you need champions across all the different frontline sectors to ensure that their sector understands how slavery may intersect with it and what their rights, roles, responsibilities and duties under the Modern Slavery Act are. We deliver a lot of training as an organisation and I think are horrified when you stand in a room of frontline professionals who now have a duty under the Modern Slavery Act and you ask them if they know about this and they are completely unsighted on it. So I do think there needs to be a drive from kind of top down in terms of raising the bar and this is what you now, we now expect of you, but also from those agencies as well. So I'm kind of the hierarchy of those agencies taking this issue on, I think. I mean, presumably the Prime Minister's kind of commitment and passion for it is also something which is... Yes, indeed. Yeah. And there is definitely greater awareness amongst frontline agencies about um, on slavery and human trafficking. But it doesn't just take uh, awareness, you know, training in this. It does take this paradigm shift. And I think that's what we're looking for, so that people uh, who are used to looking for criminals or used to looking for illegal immigrants, and, and that might even be their, their primary remit, start to see people as as victims of a crime. And, and that is a shift in the way people see uh, the person who's in front of them. Any questions from the other commissioners? Yeah, I just wondered if you could say something about any um, trends in the, sort of the nature of the, uh, of the problem. You said it's a constantly changing issue. I wonder if you could probably expand on that as to sort of what, what the trends are, but also what's been driving those, if, if we're able to identify those. Well, I think the traffickers are, are always wanting to be ahead of the game. It's, it's a very lucrative crime, and so they're always looking for uh, new ways of exploiting people. So as, as fast as we realise that, uh, for example, cannabis farms, the, yeah. the persons on the, on the premises may not be 
a perpetrator but maybe a victim. There's always new ways, so whether it's identity fraud or, or force begging or whatever it is. So um, the, the types of exploitation we're seeing are only limited by the traffickers' imagination and, and that will continue to be the case. So we're seeing victims in small companies, um, nail bars, car washes, uh, block paving people's drives, um, just being held by one person, uh, one person being held enslaved by one person um, and forced to work. So uh, uh, women as traffickers uh, is another trend that we're seeing. Large families being exploited, bank accounts being open on, opened on behalf of the family um, so that any benefits that they are eligible for will go straight into the pocket of the traffickers. So, and, and a, a big increase in the number of victims. The other thing probably worth mentioning is, is the number of victims coming from Albania specifically. So for, for all the time I've been working in this area, it's always been Nigeria, it's been the, the biggest source country. Um, but over the last two years, uh, Albania has overtaken Nigeria and now there are more than twice as many victims from Albania than from uh, Nigeria. So are they the top two countries? Yes. Yeah. And I think we can, so five years ago we very much, our client base was probably a 70% 70-30 split between West African and um, Eastern European nationalities and that's almost been a complete kind of role reversal. Um, and again, that could be down to changes in asylum policy um, rather than the numbers deter um, going down, um, which I think is, yeah, so again, that kind of centralised government impacting them, what we see on the ground. I think it's also worth mentioning that we quite like to label people as sexually exploited or domestic servitude or forced labour, and yet more and more we see multiple types of exploitation. Um, so there is very much an overlap, and we um, opened a male safe house earlier this summer, and we're starting to see men being sexually assaulted and sexually exploited as a control mechanism. So I think vulnerabilities change, um, and I think traffickers are quick to um, kind of cotton on to those different vulnerabilities, and they're quick to use different types of control mechanisms in order to get people to do what they want to do. And I think that's something that that was a very new trend that we've become aware of. Um, I think the other trend that we've become aware of is of increasingly pregnant women needing support, and I think we're unsure as to whether that's because they get pregnant, therefore they are no use and can no longer make money, um, or whether that is um, kind of before they've been trafficked, after they've been trafficked, during their trafficking. I don't think we've quite got to the bottom of that at the moment, but that again has big ramifications on terms of support required and then potentially a child being born and kind of in the UK context, what does that mean for their parents, etc. And I think that's something that we haven't got a handle on yet at all as a, a nation. But it is a fact. Yeah. yeah I also think it's important to know, because obviously the, we get the data from, from the safe houses, but I think with human trafficking, it's what's not in the data that should really <laughs> worry us, because having sort of followed this from, from various angles, in um, uh, 10 years ago, everyone thought all victims were foreign, all victims were female, and it's always sex trafficking. And it was really, in fact, I think when they were drafting the Palermo Protocol, one country wanted it to be specifically only for female victims. That was how sure they were this was a specific thing involving women. Um, so what you, so I think it's very important. Obviously, we, the Rochdale case, which now fits into that, these are Brit those are British victims. Um, and what we're hearing, for example, is actually there's Rochdale cases with men, with boys, and that boys are in the same way these girls were being told, oh, you know, that, that this is a lifestyle choice for these kind of, you know, these these girls that weren't respected by social workers and police. Similarly, these boys, the parents are, are going to social work and saying, look, my boy's being exploited by a boyfriend he met online with multiple men, and being told it's a lifestyle choice. So. so and we're not really seeing that yet in the media, in the data, these, these types of cases. But I think that's why we have to always sort of be ahead of the curve and thinking, well, what's actually not here that might be here, um, as well as what, 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 what's in the trends in terms of the data. I think a word of warning for the data as well, we do a lot of multi-agency partnership working and we go out into areas proactively with police, with um, border agencies, with health staff to look for potential victims and offer them the opportunity to leave and to let them know about their rights and entitlements. And depending on where the police decide to target, that then skews your figures. So historically, we always went to brothels because sexual exploitation, um, and now we go to car washes and nail bars. So again, the figures are skewed because of where police and other agencies are targeting. So I think 
you've probably heard it said, tip of the iceberg stuff. I think the 13,000 number is probably a good starting point. I think it's far more than that, but I'm not sure we've got a true um, kind of handle on the data around this topic at all. James, uh, did you? Oh, sorry. So I was, no, I was just going to add to that. The other, the other feature is that a lot of the men who fit all the um, criteria for being a victim of trafficking in modern slavery don't want to be identified as such. And so again, that's another hidden group of people that could be could be vast. They've come into the country to work. They want to earn money. They don't want to engage for all kinds of reasons. Um, and don't want to receive support because they want to, to be earning, even if it's in horrendous con conditions. And so they never uh, are kind of are registered, really, as victims of trafficking, and that's a vast number. I see. Yeah. James. Thank you. Um, two things. One, firstly, very briefly, um, I think we've really touched upon it there, but um, do we know explicitly what the gender... I know the data is obviously not that reliable, but currently, what's the gender? Is it not? Is it like ninety percent female, ninety five? Do we know? So what we what we do know is the is the exact uh, figures for the number of people who come into the NRM and receive mm -hmm. support from the Salvation Army. So the National Crime Agency have have larger uh, database, um, but you know these are exact figures. So. We can say that over this last year, 61% um, of victims have been female and 37% have been male mm -hmm. over in year five. Um, and, and that proportion has, been, has remained pretty much the same, but mostly, I think, because of what I just said previously about male yeah. victims not coming into the service. And we can say where people come from, the types of exploitation, but we only record the, the primary type of exploitation, and as Kate said, uh, it's very often the case that they've been exploited in multiple ways. And do you record age as well? Yes, uh, we do. Is it mostly young? Then, uh, I can give you, I can give you that exact figure. Actually, I would, uh, I would just say that our, our annual report is available, so you can look up all of the data if you want to, to get some more figures. Um, so in year five, 28% were aged between 18 and 25, 48% uh, were aged between 26 and 39, um, be uh, between the ages of 40 and 55, 19%, and then over 50, uh, 56 years of age, 3% of people. Uh, those figures won't add up, I didn't put all the points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just, just, sorry, just sorry. So the majority of people aged between 26 and 39. Yeah. Um, just for my second point, it seems like you're suggesting that EU legislation and Scotland and Wales, was I right in thinking of set good examples of how to legislate? Are there other international comparisons we should be looking at? Are there other countries which have got things right or nearly right? Um, I'm not sure about in the entirety of the law, but um, I've, there has been some really interesting resettlement and longest term support provision in Italy, Belgium, and I believe possibly France, but let me come back to you on that one. But that's around kind of how you reintegrate survivors into society. So I don't know about the entirety of their legislation in terms of slavery. Obviously I think the UK has set itself aside in making a modern slavery act. Um, but there's been there's some quite kind of innovative thinking in terms of reintegrating victims across Europe. I think different countries have definitely interpreted uh, their response to the European Convention differently. And for example, the countries that Kate mentions, um, uh, victims have to cooperate with the police to receive support in the first place. And that doesn't apply here. And in, in actual fact, we wouldn't even have taken the contract if that was the case. So strongly do we feel that victims uh, are should be entitled to support whether they choose to um, cooperate with the police or not. But I do know, for example, in Belgium, that if they cooperate with the police and if there's a conviction, then the person has automatic right to remain and they're given, given long-term support. Right. Very interesting.
Great. Okay, so nearing the end of the session, what would be great to hear from you is about policy suggestions or, you know, priorities which you think the government should have on this area. So really, we're trying to hoover up ideas so we can suggest those in, in the final report. So it would be useful to hear from you your sort of one, two, three ideas you think which the government should really focus on. Uh, I know tomorrow you kind of uh, done that already. Um, I'm particularly interested in funding as well from government as well and you whether, whether there's enough funding coming through and where it's coming from and, and where else we might look. Um, so perhaps I can start with you Anne. Uh, I think I would like to come back to Tamara's point about asylum accommodation because I, I strongly feel that there ought to be some consistency upon across the support provision and um, our uh, we're aware that some accommodation is is fine and some victims are very happy to go to content, to go to asylum accommodation and begin their, their new life and as Tamara has said, some accommodation is horrendous. <laughs> now there is provision for support providers to challenge horrendous uh, accommodation, they should not be in that kind of accommodation but nevertheless there ought to be a minimum standard of support for all victims while they're in the service. And then the second point, which I'm sure will be reiterated, <laughs> is, is the need for support when victims leave the service. Um, so our, our partners work extremely hard to ensure that the support is in place, but they can only do that with, with kind of the goodwill that other organisations show, and it's very hard to get statutory support um, in place. So I would want to give credit to all those who are supporting victims and the work that they do to try and ensure that, um, that victims leave safely. But when it happens, it only happens because of the sheer hard work that goes uh, into, into ensuring that it's, it's there by our support providers. And that should be just policy and procedure. So sorry, you, it, you're saying when they leave the service, it's civic society stepping in and it's the efforts that they provide rather than the statutory sector, which is, yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay, Tamara? Um, well, I've got so many, but I'll, I'll mention just, uh, you've talked about already the, the current provisions, but in terms of the long-term support, um, there should be an assessment for every victim, because some have very limited risks, some have huge risks. That should be within the contract with the Salvation Army that the government gives. It should be obvious that there needs to be a long-term plan for each victim that goes into the system. Um, and they should be, at the moment, victims of torture, domestic violence victims are prioritised to some extent for things like housing. It should be obvious that victims of trafficking should, Im should get that kind of requirement. They, they don't. So that's the first step. And also, in terms of um, residence permits, if you are a refugee and you get, um, the, um, get asylum, you, you get an initial five years leave or remain automatically. Mm -hmm. But if you're recognised as a victim of trafficking, you don't even get necessarily a month. It's, it's, it, you get two weeks. Um, so, so there should be some sort of um, resident permit, you know, follow one, just so that the victim has time to recuperate, for example, their compensation, which is another issue which I think is very, very important for, for recovery of the victim. So that's um, what happens in Belgium, right? Um, I'm not quite sure what happens in Belgium, um, but, but possibly. But certainly, I, I mean, I don't think there's a perfect model anywhere, to be honest. And I do think that the UK is in some ways leading the way, so I, I do think it's important to say that. But there are these serious gaps, such as in long-term support in the UK. Um, and the other area is around compensation. Um, so at the moment there's no civil, civil remedy for victims of trafficking. That, that there should be a specific civil remedy and standard. There needs to be free legal support, legal aid for, for, for the purpose of claiming compensation. At the moment there isn't, it, you, ha you have to, you know, it's all, it's all real luck if a victim manages to get legal aid, find a law who has a specialism to deal with it. Um, and most of the time they don't, I, we, we hear that victims of, of trafficking find it much harder to be wrecked to be to, for the legal aid agency to give them that 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 um, legal aid, um, so there's lots of things that need to be done. Um, I know there's a sort of um, deduction of wages a uh, sort of legislation or some sort of um, which, which was created completely separately by BIS, which shows how the departments don't work together. But that meant that basically no one um, you can't get access to recuperation if, for, for the minimum wage for more than two years. So if a victim of trafficking has been trafficked, maybe for like some of them have been trafficked for maybe 30 years of their life. And now this random law created by Biz, which didn't assess victims of trafficking at all in terms of the, the outcomes of, of their law, 
Um, so remove the two-year backstop on the national minimum wage, for example. There's lots of things that we can done. Um, and the actually final extra point that I feel we need to mention in terms of conversation is enforcement. So if a victim of trafficking finally does get the legal aid, etc., etc., and manages to get compensation, the traffickers often already left because it takes it can take two years for the legal aid agency to actually give that that victim and then um, that money. And then the enforcement is the onus is on the victim, and they don't get legal aid to do that enforcement. So most of the time, even when a victim's gone through all that and they get the money, they don't actually literally get any of that money. So, so there's, a, there's a huge amount of problems around okay. conversation. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Gosh. And I think from policy point of view, there has to be something around cross-departmental understanding of the issue. So we've got, like, that, is, uh, that for me is an easy win. And uh, we've already heard, I think, three different departments mentioned this evening. Um, so I think cross-departmental understanding of the issue. I think that then leads to a sensible discussion about what victim support needs to look like, because you've got all the right players in the room. Um, and that then covers the long-term issues that have been aforementioned, housing, legal support, jobs, education. How do we support long-term? Um, and that will be an interesting policy suggestion in our current kind of are we again going to open the floodgates? Is this going to be another system that people can abuse? So I think that's an interesting policy conundrum. I think then that leads to the enshrining of support and the NRM within um, within law. So I think kind of first you've got to get all the departments on the same page in policy, then you can have a sensible discussion about what it needs to look like in terms of support, and then I think you can have a sensible discussion around where the funding sits and actually should the funding sit centrally, should it actually be mainstreamed out into local authorities, what does that need to look like? But I don't think you can have any of those discussions until we all understand the kind of bigger picture piece first. Um, and I think probably the final one would be something about an effective response for children, which again plays into the all departments need to be on the same page. We are not effectively housing children, supporting children under the current, that we, we're using the Children's Act, which is correct, but the provision we have in place to support children currently is not keeping those children safe. Okay, very interesting. Thank you uh, to all three of you for joining us today and sharing your time and your thoughts. We're very, very grateful for that. Uh, like I say, please do keep in touch um, and feed ideas into us. We'd like to perhaps send you our, our ideas and see what you think of them before we go into the publication stage. Uh, and that will be likely mid-2017. Um, but yes, have a nice evening and thank you for coming along. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to, to, to bed. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> did you notice? Yeah. <laughs>